Hey, I'm Michael Dorinda. And I'm Jake Bennett. And welcome to episode 158 of the North Meets South Meets Hopes and Dreams podcast. <laughs> meets, meets Hopes and Dreams? Oh, I've got to hear about this. What are the hopes and dreams here? I hope and dream that we have something to talk about oh, this episode. We will, oh, we've got plenty. We've got plenty. Let me start by saying... Um, this last week, I had the best mustache I've ever had in my life, and it was incredible. It lasted for almost a whole week, and today I had to get rid of it, and uh, I was sad because, you know, here's the deal. Let me, let me be real honest. I had to shave it this morning because I had like this mustache power thing going on. And I was yesterday, I was undefeated. I could not lose yesterday. And I didn't want to go to work today and ruin the streak. So I shaved it. I was like, I'm done. Let me tell you. Can I just tell you real quick? I hate, I don't want to like, you know, break my own patting myself on the back here, but I'm just going to tell you what happened. So on Friday, I went into work last week, had my mustache. By the way, here it is. I do a freedom stash every year. So like for the 4th of July, I shave a must. I do a mustache. So I grow up my like facial hair for June. And then July, I did a, I'd do a mustache. I got eight guys to do it with me this year, which is so fun. So next year, maybe I'll start a Twitter, a Twitter group and see who I can get to do it. And just, you know, freedom stash for the win. It's going to be great. Even Australians and Canadians, you're all invited to do the freedom stash. It's going to be awesome. So uh, did my freedom stash. Went to work on Friday. And we have this basketball hoop up on a door, like one of those little Nerf basketball hoops, okay, mm-hmm. in our banking department. And then there's a, there's a literally a tape line on the floor. Uh, one of my buddies yeah. brought it in, and the original idea was we were each going to put a dollar in for the week, and whoever got the shot first earns the money. But, and then, I, you know, we ended up starting getting decent at it. And so, anyway. Yeah. I've made it once a month. It has to be, here's the deal. It has to be your first shot of the day. You can't warm up, no warm ups. Right, right. One right. shot from the line. Mm-hmm. If you make it, you get to put your name on a sheet of paper that's on the door. Great. So it had been two months since I'd made this shot. I could not get it. And, um, and so anyway, I went on on Friday. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Little mini ball. Yep. So on Friday, I went in with the mustache, made it, nailed it. So excited. Got my name put on nice. the door. Okay. Nice. Then I go in Monday, still have the mustache. Make it, make it first shot. So two days in a row, that's never happened to me before. Well, then there's also another line that's like three feet back from the regular line that we call Mm -hmm. the money ball shot. Nobody's ever made it first shot. So I had, Mm -hmm. mind you, I just made the regular shot. So I back up. I'm like, hey, I'm feeling it. Let's go for it. I made the second shot, the money ball shot. Yes. Unbelievable. So then I tell the developers that morning when we're having our stand up, I'm like, hey, by the way, it's a really good day for me. You know, I, I feel like I'm going to win the game that we play every day. In our development meeting, we have this thing called Boom Party, which is like Bomberman. And so if you win all three rounds, you get the crown for the day in our dev chat. So I told them, I called it. I was like, hey, by the way, I'm going to win this today. Um, and they were not going easy on me because they want to kill you. They, there's no way, yeah. you know, it's like on the last round, everybody's against you. I won. Yeah. I beat every, I won all three games. Unbelievable. Unbelievable day yesterday. So I had to shave it just to make sure that I didn't screw up the streak today. And yeah, uh, yeah. so that was that was the story <laughs> of the stash this week. It was a good week. It was a good week. Well, so. yeah, we I got one of those little hoops for my birthday this year from the in-laws. And mm-hmm. it's like it's got rubber like strip on the door. So it's like yep. not yep. supposed to kind of wobble around. But any time the ball touches any part of that thing, the whole thing just shakes and wobbles around. <laughs> yeah. So if your yeah. shot is not dead in the center of the ring, it's not going in nine times out of ten. Right. Because yep. it just like flings the ball out. And we've got um, 2.4 meter ceilings here, which is like uh-huh. fairly standard. Um, is it like eight feet? What is that? Let me see here. Let me see here. Yeah, yeah. It's about uh, seven feet. feet, seven feet, eleven inches. Yeah, so it's yeah. like seven feet, yeah. eight, you know, ten and a half inches. So, so almost it's, a, feet, it's yeah. fairly standard for like most homes built these days. Two point seven, which would be like nine feet, I guess, um, or twelve. I think it's it's usually like eight foot, nine foot, and twelve foot ceilings or whatever. Other eight feet, ceilings. yeah, almost nine feet, yeah, almost yeah. nine feet. It's two point seven. So inch. there's there's not much room to get arc. Right, the shot like yeah. it's you have to shoot it very flat and you have to be very precise with it. And so, it's you want the secret. We, you want I, the secret. You know what it is. Don't be I terrible shoot, like me. It's called it's called the cobra. It's the underhand the cobra. and and right. and it's a backspin with just like right. this. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the trick. I'll and so that it. allows you to start low at like your waist, mm-hmm. and then you get the backspin. You get that shooter's right. roll and lay it right in there, man. 
after, that's the after trick. give that a go because it's like yep. it's easier for Eli because Eli will go right up to the ring and he's exactly you know, he's yeah. hip height so he can actually get some arc on his shot. <clears throat> mm-hmm. No good for me. So mm-hmm. the amount of times that boy towels me up, you know, twenty to four or something like that, it's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. That's so funny. Yeah, but he loves it. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, he's on uh, he's on school holidays at the moment. So we okay. I I had him yesterday. For the day and we went to the shops they've got like one of these giant chess chess boards he's like let's play chess. oh cool and like, do you like chess he could play chess no <laughs> oh oh okay okay he, and you're, I, I know, thought like he's I know like, no, play chess? very vaguely the rules like i know okay. that the pawns can move like one space and i know that mm. the the knight can go like in an l shape and mm-hmm. queen mm-hmm. or the, you know so it's it's very loose like there's no rule and he's six so it's like just let him win because you don't yeah, want an incident absolutely. in in the mall, so that was a bit of fun. Because he that just, is fun. I had to I had to stop taking all of his pawns eventually because he just. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure you want to put your piece there? Oh, like, what funny. what shape can like the knight move in? He goes, oh yeah, yeah. I probably shouldn't. So, yeah, good but call. in the end, good he call. just decided to take, just like take his bishop or whatever and walk over and just take my king i'm like all right well that's been 20 minutes that's long enough and there haven't been any tears so let's get out of here before something nice. happens nice that's awesome so yeah i, yeah, I do I, want to look I've, it up because uh, like he enjoys it so i'd like to at least have a knowledge of like which pieces can move where like a right, fairly yeah. accurate knowledge of that and then the rest we can just make up as we go i along. think that like chess.com has mm-hmm. you know some tutorials and stuff uh, yeah it's it's Pretty simple. Rooks move in straight lines. Bishops ruin root move in diagonals. The knights move in the, in the uh, L shape. Then you've got the queen can move anywhere. The king can mm-hmm. uh, move one space anywhere, and then the pawns can move two spaces forward on their first move and only one space forward on any other move. But they can only attack diagonal. They can't attack directly in front of themselves. Right. Fair so right. like yeah, yep. That's every. Other, that's all. all right. of them. To, that's all the moves. Check that out. Nice. Yep. Look up fool's mate. That's a good one too to know. So if you don't, if you're playing with somebody who doesn't know how to play chess, you can typically checkmate them in about three or four moves, which makes you feel really fun. It's it's really good. It's a good move. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, okay. So shall we talk about the stuff? So I think maybe one thing to talk about real quick is uh, that Tim McDonald put out a new Laravel pennant feature that dropped this week. I've been waiting uh, for this for so long. Have you? Okay, so so let's talk real quick about feature flags and the idea behind them and what uh, things it affords you as a development team. And then let's talk about Pennant. So, and then let's talk about the new feature as well. So let's talk real quick about like feature flags. So the typical way that you roll out features without feature flags is you just say, okay, we've been working on this feature for a week and we're pretty confident it's going to work. And we've tested it locally and we've tested it in our CI environment. And now we're going to ship it to production. And so you ship it to production and you watch your error tracking service to make sure that you know nothing breaks in production. And hopefully you've got like a group of, of people that you typically say like, hey, Scott, can you go try this out? Because, you know, you're a pretty good tester and you know, just, just try, try it out and see if you can do anything with it. And they break it, whatever. Um, and then you're like, ah, oh, crap, it, it is, it is broken. I didn't think about that. And then you have to like roll back and then you have to go fix it. And then you kind of do it again. You couple, couple iterations of this and, and, um, there you have it. The problem with that is, um, you know, ideally you don't have a breakage and most of the time you probably don't, but there's always this sort of like lurking fear in the back of your mind. Like, Oh, I it's, I don't think it's going to mess up, but I, I always yeah. like want to ship it on like a Monday night, like after everybody's gone. So I can be the first one to test it sort of deal. Mm-hmm. Well, feature flags removes that barrier. For me, it does, at least. Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to ship a feature to production without exposing it to anybody except for yourself or a group of beta testers or whoever else you want to bring in on yep. that one. And so um, you basically surround your feature with, uh, in Laravel, you actually get a directive with this pennant Uh, package. And in the directive, you can say at feature, and then you can either pass a string in there um, if you name the feature with a string, or there's a class-based resolution that you can uh, use. And so you pass in the class there, at feature, and then the name of the class. And if that feature is enabled for that particular user over that particular scope, it will show it. And if it it is not enabled, then it won't. And so you can use the blade directive, and then there's also, um, you know, uh, a 
facade that you can do the same thing. Uh, feature uh, enabled or uh, whatever it is inside of your controllers or inside of your actions or your jobs or whatever it is. And so you can kind of bifurcate your logic and decide what you want to do based on who has the feature and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's the great part about it. Um, and for me, it has helped me ship more often and with greater confidence than I ever did before. Uh, because even if a feature isn't completely 100% bulletproof tested, I know it's exactly perfect, I can ship it and I can mm -hmm. iterate on it after getting yeah. it into production. As long as I know it's not going to like bork everything, I don't even have to yeah. like push it to everybody. I can say it's the end of the week, it's Thursday, I'm going to push it out. We'll maybe do some tweaks next week and we'll push it out again. And, and there you go. Um, but man, it's insanely powerful. Um, how long have you guys been using that sort of development flow for, Michael? It's It's been pr relatively new to me and I've been loving it. Yeah, we, we've been using it sort of haphazardly, I guess, for the last mm -hmm. five or six months, I reckon. Like, and when I say haphazardly, we've we've kind of like gated the feature in the back end but forgotten to hide it on the front end. And so uh, there's okay, been like well, people that have clicked a link and then get gotten a you know a four or three or whatever because the feature's not actually active, but the the link to that feature was visible in the menu bar and things like that. So mm -hmm. and this is I guess part of the problem with having a a separate front end is that you you don't have the blade directive. So when you're building the back end functionality, you have have to remember to like expose that through inertia or wherever else of your API and making sure that the front end is actually built in such a way that it considers the feature flags. Whereas when you're when you're using, you know, Livewire, if you're using Blade, it's it's yep. more evident because you know you are more likely to be building the front end than if you have a separate back and front end team working on it. So um yeah it's been it's been nice. But when Pennant came out which was what Laracon US Laracon, last year. Yeah. Uh yeah. Right around yeah. No, no, you know what? Actually, I think it was talked about in Laracon India. Was it earlier maybe. than maybe. I think they were talking about it then, but it wasn't released then. I think it like mm -hmm. sort of released with Laravel ten. I don't know. I don't remember. That's yeah. a good question. I'm not sure. So yeah, when when it came out, you know, we, we started playing around with it and I I remember using it for the Laracon AU website last year where I wanted to have a feature, like to use the feature flags as like a time bomb kind of thing that like show mm, this thing mm -hmm. after this day. But the yeah. way that the feature flags were resolved by Pennant at the time was it would resolve it once and then it would associate it with the user, right? And because mm -hmm. the Laracon AU website is more of a like a visitor, a guest user kind of thing, there's no user to associate it with. So when it resolved that feature, you know, it was it was before that date, for example, we wanted to show the schedule after a certain date. Because it had already resolved it, it doesn't resolve yeah. it again. Correct. Um and so, you know, we worked around that um somehow. I don't know. It basically is like I you think, can't use it at that point. Yeah. It's like Yeah. Yep. So I think you I think can't the way use that it in that way necessarily. Yeah. Right. I think the way that we worked around it in the end was to use like the the explicit array storage so that every request ah, okay would every request would it, do it right there you so go. with with this feature that that tim shipped this week he messaged me and he's like i finally did it ah oh, he messaged. <laughs> was, oh, okay. was to, nice was to in, introduce this before hook in a similar way to like laravel policies work where you can yeah. provide a escape hatch i suppose to to do a test that like if you have an admin user logged in they default have permission to do everything in the application. So this before hook in Pennant works in a similar way where you could put these kind of things in there and then get it to trigger based on an environment variable or get it to based on, you know, a time switch or something like that. And that way it would always check that before then resolving it from whatever the normal case would be, you know, to use a lottery or to resolve it from the database or whatever else. So yeah. that's going to be really useful in a lot of situations like that where you want to you know either globally enable or disable a feature without impacting on the already resolved values in the database because it will skip doing that those checks which is is huge so let me kind of go back just a, a quick step to talk about this so each uh each feature if you're using class-based resolution which is what we do um 
when that feature is in, is um, first encountered in your code base, um, what it will do is it will, previous to this, it would attempt to resolve that feature. And so the resolve method is called on that feature and it gets past a scope. Now the default scope that the feature gets is the logged in user. That's what passes in to that scope by default. Now you can change that if you want to. If you're using the feature facade, you can pass your own scope. So the scope could be, hey, I don't want the user, I want the user's team. And then the resolve function now gets the team. Or you can pass a string. So you could say scope is, and what we've done sometimes is we say scope is global, just a string called global. And then what it does, is uh, when it encounters that flag, it will pass that scope in and then it stores the results of that resolve method, either truthy or falsy, true or false, inside of your preferred storage uh, driver. So in our case, we use the database. And so if, uh, if it looks when it's going to resolve that and sees that that scope, that particular scope has already been resolved, it will not resolve it again, which is why that global scope is really nice. You just resolve it once and then it, it's resolved for everybody. Um, however, what Michael said is, is true, which is once it's resolved once, it's never resolved again. So if you wanted to do something where you said, okay, now I want to enable it for everybody, what you'd have to do is you'd have to wipe out all the values for everybody in the database, which is annoying because you have to do that in, in production somehow. You know, you have to go kill all those database records um, or, and or you have to you know, modify the code, whatever. So with this check now, and I think there's one thing to point out here, Michael, that's maybe, um, I don't know if this is, strictly this but what he said is this is it the before it's performing always in memory checks before resolving a feature's stored value that always in memory i'm not sure what exactly he means by that um, like you would always do it as opposed to you know not like skipping uh, the check if there is a, a value in your drive uh, in thank your you storage driver yeah Yep. Yep. That's makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. And so in the case that you want to always resolve this particular thing, uh, then it will do that. That before check will always do it. And you don't have to return a value, right? You can just not return a value. So instead of, um, yep, you can just return all or, or not return anything just return void. And in the case that it returns void, it just won't, it won't do anything. It'll just fall through to the resolve method. Um, yep. but if you do return a truth or a truthy value from that, it will, you know, either enable or disable that feature for, for that, that thing. So, um, the time bombs thing worked, like you said there. And then the other thing that's interesting that we talk about, um, that we've talked about too, is like, if you had, um, you know, so, so the way he calls that is not a time bomb, but like basically a rollout schedule, right? Yeah. Schedule a feature yep. rollout based to be on like this date for everybody. So we have a beta group that's going to get it, but then, uh, two weeks from now, everybody should get it unless we need to specify otherwise, which I think is also really great. So, yeah. Really cool addition there and much needed addition. I think that's uh yeah. that's that's pretty awesome. So also the ability for that one. to whether you do this in the database or if you do it in an environment variable, you know, being able to globally toggle a feature. You know, you might yeah. have rolled something out and it's, you know, some issue, like maybe it's connecting with a third party and the third party has got some downtime or whatever, rather than persistently hitting that and then degrading the experience of your users, you can just turn it off using, you know, either a database flag or an environment variable ah. flag and say, you know, this thing, this thing is now off. So that's where I would that's also That's a great point. The before. Yeah. Yeah. In the before, I'd be like, no, this, this feature, yes, it's a feature in the application, but we're globally turning it off for whatever reason, you know, abuse. Love and, that. Yeah. That's a great idea. And so then that makes it really easy party. to manage. Yes, because then you can resolve it basically for a scope or globally, right? You could do both. You don't have to choose one or the other. You can you can do both. Nice. Yep. Yeah, that's a really powerful feature. I'm yep. liking and that's, this a lot. And that's a good shortcut, you know, so that you don't have to then go and purge all of the already right. resolved records. Yes. Which means it doesn't impact on the the status of, you know, individual users might have something enabled. You don't have to remove right. it all and have to re-resolve it. That is saying, also hey, a huge problem. Right now, yes. we're turning this off, um, and that way, you know, once you flick that global switch again, it will go back to whatever it was before. So, if you had access yeah. before, you will continue to have access once that before hook, you know, whatever that is, is is restored to that original state as well. So, yep. yeah, I'm very, yeah, because very have, excited for that they're... feature. Yeah, we have had ones where we've we've turned it on just for a specific group. Um, like manually, we went into the database and edited the value to just return true. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was particular to those, 
those users. And maybe that's not a great way to do it, but like we, we needed to do it that way for a period of time. But then there was a situation where I needed to turn it off and it was like, dang it. Well, I have to either just modify that code and re-resolve it for everybody or just always, you know, I don't know. It was, it was just goofy. So I didn't really have a good way to yeah. do that, but this is exactly then, that you know, way. Depending on where you are, if you're not, you know, if you're in an organization that has documented policies around, like I know as part of ISO and as part of SOC 2, like there's the whole, someone has to approve the code. There's got to right, be, right. you know, all of these steps that you have to go through, which can delay, mm -hmm. you know, just be, versus just having a switch that you can just turn off. Um, yeah. And that can then, you know, I think we spoke about this previously where we can then put the feature flags in the hands of the business rather than the Correct. developers. And the developers, like, yeah. Well, well, you know, there's a compliance issue here or there's some other business reason that we want to disable this feature so they can just go into some interface and just turn it off. I love that. So, yeah, I really like yeah, that. Big, big, um, big fan of this this edition. Huge. The the other thing that's uh, that I, maybe we could talk about pennant for just a minute here is that these features, if it's not returned from the 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 before, typically you are invoking some sort of storage mechanism that you're using to resolve these things out of right. So it's whether it's the database or whether it's you know. Um, Redis or some other some other deal, um, you're having to query or go grab something to figure out if it's enabled or not. So just like any other thing, uh, if you're not eager loading those values, you end up making a query for each one of them. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the things you're going to want to probably do is if you have a page with a lot of different feature flags on it, it's a great idea to resolve those ahead of time uh, because if you don't, you go look at your Laravel debug bar, you're going to see you know, one query per feature. And so that can rack up the number of queries you've got uh, pretty quickly. Um, one thing that we did to help solve this problem is we really there's this there's this one page where we're, we're doing a lot of rapid application development on it. And this is one of the only places that we are using the feature flagging pennant stuff. And there's, there's other applications, but in this application, that's where we're using it the most. And so that features directory, the Laravel app features directory, um, what we'll do is we actually have a little command that scans through that list of classes that's in there and then says, resolve this for all users ahead of time. Like every single user in the database or so, yeah, every single user that we have in the database, resolve it for all of them. Now we've only got hundreds of users, right? So like it's in yeah. this in particular case, it's all internal users. And so we can resolve it for everybody ahead of time. Um, and then what we do is we say, okay, now um, get feature double colon loaded. And what I think that does is it says basically grab the distinct features that are in the database. Um, uh, and give me the list of those. Um, so then what we do is we say, bump that feature loaded list up against that list of classes that we just grabbed out of the file system. And any of the features that no longer exist, purge them from the database. So get rid of them. They're old, they're stale. Uh, and then we cache that list of features that I just, that I just mentioned, and we eager load those features um, every time that that big page is loaded. So we basically ahead of time when we're doing our, our pipeline, our continuous integration deployment pipeline, we're in advance loading all of them, caching all of them, and then asking them to be eager loaded on that page, which works really well. Um, I was going to talk to Tim about that and see if there was like some way to, to do that. If you tagged a feature with some tag or something like that and just could say eager load all the features with this tag, that would be really handy, I attribute. think. An at ooh, even better. See, there we go. I, I think because having to eager load them manually, you kind of have to look through all of the things that are on that page and you just kind of have yeah. to know, oh, these are the yep. ones we're using. Um, but it'd be nice to just be able to tag them and then say eager load all these. I'm sure I could roll something like that myself, mm. you know, just throw it on there and then yeah, be like, I mean, hey, Tim, what precedent. do you think of this? Yeah, there's precedent in the framework now or using attributes for that kind of behavior, yeah. the, the model observers and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, a some some attribute that is well named by the Laravel team, no doubt, uh, that, that allows you to do that might be might be an approach to, to go. And since I'm already doing this, so like since I'm already in my CI doing this thing where I'm when I'm deploying, I'm looping through every feature and sort of pre-caching it, you know what I mean? I could just say 
and each one, like I could have like a global list of loaded features and then I could have, here's the features with this tag and here's the features with this tag. And so if I said, you know, um, feature load for scope user, whatever it is, I can't remember exactly what it is, but then you list all the features. Load missing is what it is. Feature load mm -hmm. missing. And then you pass in the list of features. Um, it'll eager load them for you. So just one query instead of 15 or 20 or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Um, so interesting. Okay. Some homework for me. Mm. That could be, that could be cool, but yeah. I've really liked using it and I feel like it has, uh, done a lot of good for me and yeah. really excited about this new one. So pretty cool. Someone, someone will no doubt write some kind of filament plugin or Nova plugin or, or mm -hmm. something, you know, to, to manage features in the application that you can just drop into your app and then off you go, which would be yeah. really handy as well. Okay. And go ahead. On the subject of eager loading, if we're ready to move on from, from, from Panic. I have one, um, I have, I do have one more thing to talk about with features, if, but we can okay. come back to it because it's not necessarily okay. specific to features. So go ahead, eager okay. loading. So we, we have this like one endpoint in our application that is responsible for calculating the state of an application. So I like there this are multiple already. steps. There are multiple steps in mm -hmm. in the application. Yes, right? yes, multiple steps. And yes. each each step has a status, and the status could be you know complete or pristine, which means it hasn't been accessed yet. I like, like that. A oh, that is state. such a good name. I've called, I've used fresh before. I hate fresh. fresh. Pristine yeah. is better. Pristine. Way better. Yes. Yeah. So each each step can exist in one of these three statuses. Um, but sometimes you might move between a, a wizarded flow. So the, the steps are different or there's different requirements depending on what you're in. So anytime you open an application, we hit this endpoint that goes through and calculates the state that the application is in, where you're up to, how much you've completed, whatever else. For, as it turns out, two years, right, th this endpoint has existed. It has, <clears throat> this is a persistent bug that has been there for two years, but it presented sporadically. And it was not like a per application thing. It was just like a time of day thing. If you know the right number of people happen to open an application at the same time, like weird things would happen. And it, instead of taking like a second or a few hundred milliseconds, it would take 30 seconds or 60 seconds, or it Yikes. would time out. And because of the sporadic presentation of this bug, it's been very difficult to track down because usually by the time you get a report of it and you look at it, the issue's gone away. It's fixed, yep. It's fixed, it's gone away. But it's always crept up, you know, every now and then and to the point where no one was reporting it anymore because it wasn't happening anymore. Um, but yesterday, so we've been doing these these um, merging of tenants over the past few weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we've we've done six out of seven so far so we we've basically almost quite there considerably grown the size of this single tenant over the last few weeks and and yesterday fortunately when i was not at work uh, there were all these reports of like all of these timeouts and these this endpoint that you know is typically fine but sporadically not was like getting to the point where every time it was open it would cause an error and I got a message at like eight o'clock last night, nine o'clock last night from my boss, who's like, I have cracked it finally. He's like, please review this PR. And what it boiled down to was we had changed a bunch of stuff from doing some explicit queries to using eager loads or lazy eager loads. So you can do mm. like model arrow load, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So we were saying, you know, instead of querying the database again, we'll like, just say go and get me these records and it was some you know there was some nesting so we were getting like a status dot step dot state or whatever it was the problem was as we had merged the tenants together we had gone from like a few hundred records of a few hundred of these types of records in a tenant to tens of thousands of records in this tenant mm. and because this thing was like doing model arrow load whatever it was loading, not every single one related to the application. Oh gosh! Every single record that existed in the database of that record type. Now, when you've only got hundreds of records, sure, that's going to present sporadically, isn't it? Because you know sometimes you load a 
couple of hundred records and no one will be doing anything and it'll be fine. And sometimes you'll have three or four people do it and it's going to go through this every single time. So the solution to this problem was to like explicitly add like where has on the uh, oh okay. the lazy okay, load sure. to say like load arrow statuses arrow where has application ID equal the application that was being loaded. You would think so that relationship of loading, would just figure that out. Like you would think it would just do yeah, that. But it, but it was not, so it was not like the parent relationship. It was not the application that we were learning from. Okay. It was from like the application. A nested child uh, sort of thing. The, the wizard. Yeah. So it, it had lost that linkage. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, we were, we were eager loading the records we thought we needed. It's just because they were not scoped to the application that was right. being requested. It was loading, you know, a, a few weeks ago, a couple of hundred records, and then it was a thousand records, and then it was five thousand records. Until yesterday, you know, you have seven or eight people open tens of thousands of records at once, and it's like churning through each of those things to try and calculate the state, uh, the state, and it was like so. Effectively, it was recalculating the state for every single application <laughs> every time oh one application gosh. was open. That's brutal. And and the re- you know we got to the point where this was happening so much that like the IOPS were through the roof on, on yeah, the RDS yeah. instance, which then caused the CPU credits to go bye-bye. Through the roof and, as well. Uh, yep. Yeah. So basically we solved this two-year-old bug. Well, I say we, my boss solved this, this two-year-old bug within, you know, 12 hours out of necessity because it took, you know, the database down, which by and large is very over-provisioned for our needs. It's just this one endpoint. You had to havoc. you had to get all those records in there in order to be able to reproduce it consistently enough to yeah. find out what the problem like was. This, this is really if, kind of if what it was not for to. the fact that yeah, if it was not for the fact that we merged the tenants together, this this issue might it not have never been yeah, for two, three, five not. years, whatever. But because we combined, yeah. you know, thousands and thousands of applications over over you know several years, and it's like, and I looked at, the, and I'm like, oh, oh no, I I wrote that eager load. <laughs> Two years oh, ago. No. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. It's days, easy to do. It really is easy to do. Crashing the production database back to zero. Zero. Back to zero. Well, the thing is, it actually was crashing it all the time. It's just, you know, I had a similar situation yep. today where it was like we we had a worker, a background sort of Lambda thing that was just running jobs and crashed our main application, serve, like our actual like system of record, just literally pegged the CPU, yep. hung. Everybody had to get out. And we're like, okay, what was that about? And so Redis. go in and Lime Redis. restart it and like restart the application server. And like, what's going on? Okay. All right. And so I was like, pause, pause our lambda there. And it was like, okay. So everything came back up. We're like, okay, let's let's start it. And then we started it and watching the CPU like pegged. Like, dang it. Okay, pause it again. Went back down to 60. I'm like, okay, start it one more time. Grow, 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 pegged. I'm like, okay, well, we know what it is. So <laughs> that's that's like, you know, so I just had to reduce the number of workers and then it, it mm-hmm. kind of settled down a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it, sometimes it's just like you don't know until, you know, I've never had that many jobs in there before. I, it was yeah. like 10,000 yeah. jobs backed up and it's like, you just never yeah. know. Uh, I've never had to, it's never been pushed that hard. And so yeah. whatever, can, I guess. Can, so I had to limit the number of workers. Yeah, you can plan for like some end state, but, a lot of the time you're so busy focused on like what can we deliver now to you know yes. make the business get there that it's like sometimes these issues at scale don't actually present until you're at scale. And, Agreed. The, and, and until you and until you get there. You won't know. And, and you're just like, if you yeah, always you were trying to prepare for that and always trying to like um, mitigate those risks before they became risks, you'd never ship. That's the problem. Yeah. So it's like yeah. Yeah. you kind of just got to get it out there. That's yeah. why feature and flags are important. And, like, and then secondly, like black, you know, black fire, whatever it is, like those those monitoring mm-hmm. things too. To be like, where are the slow queries? Oh, okay, these yeah. are the slow queries. I need to go fix those up. Yeah, and, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to how well you respond to those yeah. issues and what's your, um, you know, workflow like in terms of of addressing it when it happens. Yes. And we've got, yes. you know, I've, I've poo-pooed Datadog in the past because it is like a very heavy, very complex piece of software that, you know, does a lot of stuff. 
But if not for like the traces in there and like the query monitoring, all of that stuff, we wouldn't have been able to kind of narrow down the exact query, which then mm -hmm. helped us narrow down the exact line of code, which then allowed yeah. us to figure out, you know, oh, we were not scoping that query. So instead of taking, you know, 10, 15 seconds for this query to execute in isolation, you know, when no one else was using the system, it's now like consistently less than one second. So that's awesome. So yeah, it feels good. Uh, it feels good. Yeah, it's it's good. And like, I wasn't involved in the fix, so that's nice. <laughs> like, believe it or not, like, yeah, yes, I introduced it, and if I was at work, I probably would have gotten to the bottom bottom of it. But it's nice that we've grown as as a business and as a team to the point where like anyone can look at any of these things and just deal with it. Um, so that's you know from a from a team and business growth perspective, it's it's really good. That's awesome. Yeah. It's nice to have somebody else on the team other than you that can fix the problem, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, does my boss, good. shout out shout out to Sam. He he has changed nice job, his, Sam. his uh, profile picture in Slack to Fireman Sam because he just seems to nice. be putting out fires for everyone lately. So, <laughs> Fireman Sam, I love it. That's great. That's funny. All right, dude, let's wrap this one up. What do we got, 157? Is that what it was? 158. 158. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, hanging out with us, find show notes for this episode at northmeetsouth.audio slash 158. Hit us up on Twitter at Michael Durna at Jacob and at North South Audio. And as always, if you like the show, rate it up in your podcatcher of choice. Five stars would be incredible, amazing, and awesome. All right, folks. See you in two weeks. Peace. Bye. -o.